There we go. So good morning, everybody. I'm Amanda Brock. I'm the CEO of Open UK, and it's really lovely to be back here in Amsterdam, a city that I used to call my home, lived here for a couple of years, a few years ago. I started my journey in open source 15 years ago, almost exactly, when I joined Canonical. I was a lawyer for 15 years, and I joined Canonical as the general counsel, the head lawyer, and I ran the legal team there for five years. Um, since I left Canonical, I've had a number of different roles around open source. One of my favorites was chairing an advisory board for the UN. I've also got a role with the Open Standards Board in the UK. S open source software is um, under, for some reason, standards in the UK. And I'm an elected board member to the Open Source Initiative. Last year, we published this book. Uh, it has my name on the front as I'm the editor. It's got 26 authors, 24 chapters. It's also known as the fucking book because the fucking book took my holiday away last year. But it got published and it filled a gap. And it filled a gap in the market where there was no real explanation of law policy and practice across the board that was up to date. And because we started it five years ago, it doesn't cover AI. And that's really frustrating. You know, all the content was into edit about a year before the book came out. So uh, look out for something on AI coming your way relatively soon. The little flyer is not necessarily to encourage you to buy it, but if you do buy it, there's a 30% off code on the flyer, and you can get it free on download as an open access book sponsored by the Veach Foundation. Uh, you can find that on the OUP website, but it's really easy to find on amandabrock.com. We launched with a, a panel session with some of the female authors at All Things Open last year. And bizarrely, that went viral on the Chinese internet. So we now have a Mandarin translation that will be in publication by October. And I, I spend a lot of my time doing stuff like this, sort of wandering around talking to people in rooms in different countries. So at Open UK, I want to I wanna talk to you just for a few minutes about Open UK, because my topic today is will open source fail? And the work we do at Open UK is very relevant to that. So we were set up in 2019, and we've sort of broken the model on country organizations for open technology. First thing we did was we brought together the three opens, open source software, open hardware, open data. And those are what we define as open technology. We think everything will fall under that. And we look to create UK leadership, but also global collaboration, which is hugely important. We have two full-time staff. We're recruiting currently for a community manager, a third member of staff. But most of the team are pro bono um, volunteers. We run the organization like an open source project in many ways. You'll recognize some of these people. A number of them are speaking at KubeCon this week. And uh, Hannah Foxwell, who is one of our ambassadors, is doing a lightning talk today at 530 so we've got about 130 to 150 people at any point in time who are really active in the organization and who bring the work that we do to life. Um, we have a number of advisory boards who help us with the technical side of things. And we have uh, an AI and a quantum advisory board that we're currently setting up and looking for people to be part of. So you'll, you'll notice quite a diverse organization and we really try to create a sense of belonging in what we do. We had a conference, our first annual conference in February. We had about 800 people there, 7th and 8th of February. We had 88.3% of the people who signed up turn up. And I, I just put that figure in because it's kind of incredible. I still haven't quite worked out how we got that to happen. But this is a little bit about who was there. So the speakers were really unusual. They were really unusual in that nobody pays to be on a stage with us and they never will. But also, if you look at the makeup, it was 57.4% male. So almost half the, the speakers weren't male. If you look at the ethnicity, 76% white, not brilliant. But then if you go to our delegates, and this is something that I take great pride in, about a third of the delegates were women. Now that's a little bit more than the tech average, but it's a lot more than the open source average. And if you look at the ethnicity, 50.3% white. So almost half of the people who turned up at our conference weren't white. And I think that must be almost unheard of in tech, let alone in open source. So we're trying to build a diverse and inclusive um, organization. And I have to say the work that Cloud Native has done has made that helpful, has made that easier for us, partly because the, the focus on bringing in younger people, bringing in a real mix and diverse audience to Cloud Native has allowed us to, to pick up on the, the Kubernetes community in the UK, which is really thriving. 
And these are some of the people, the companies that sponsor us and make this possible. Now, we work on three pillars. We work on community, which is about bringing people together. And we do that through things like awards, through an honours list. And we now have meetups. Our next meetup in London, if anyone is around, is on the 26th of April. And we're starting those across the UK. Hannah's going to be running them in Yorkshire. We'll have them in Bristol. We'll have them in Birmingham. have them in Scotland. So if anybody's based in the UK, you're very welcome to come along. Wherever possible, what we do is free, and we use the sponsorship money to cover the costs and the overhead, which is why we have a small staff. We keep the staff costs down, and we flex and contractors when we need them. And we use the collective voice that this organization gives us to influence laws and policies, and that's going to be really important as we go through this presentation. So we responded to the Supreme Court, to the Oracle Google litigation. We joined an open source amicus brief. And we responded to NTIA on the S-bombs when the, the Biden administration produced the executive order and that, which I'll talk more about. We've also worked to pull together reporting, reporting to demonstrate the value of open source in our country to our public sector, to our government and to enterprise. And with these three phases in the, the first year, we very much did a literature review. We looked at what was out there. We cut the existing data to demonstrate it for the UK. We then evolved through doing a survey. We repeat that every May, so we'll be doing our, our next survey this May. And the survey gives us data that can be built into economic modelling. And then in the th third phase, we were going to COP26, so we started to look at the values and sustainability, the broader picture. We did something similar last year, and we keep trying to evolve this piece, looking at the value of open source, the economic value. And it's going to be critical that we as a community, we as businesses, we as enterprise can demonstrate this to our governments. If you look at the top left there, we showed 4.87 to 6.65 billion in investment in the UK in open source. And that's time. That's the measure of time committed by UK organizations to open source. It's five times the amount of money that the government put into the recovery fund for digital in the UK in the same year. So it gives you an idea of the strength and the importance of open source in our, our economy. And all of this is online. It's all Creative Commons. You're welcome to take it, do what you want with it. Attribute us, please. But it's all on uh, Open UK slash State of Open. We hope to have a, a phase one for 2023 published in this coming week. And then we'll have three more phases. So we're going to do a four phase report this year because we have an election in a year. And we've got a lot of messaging that we want uh, politicians to hear. We were very involved in setting the agenda around sustainability and open technology. In 2021, we were at COP26 in Glasgow. We had one of the biggest tech events with a couple of hundred people there. And we have a free to attend event in September, on the 14th of September in Edinburgh. If anybody can make it, you'd be very welcome to join us. We released this um, blueprint for a data center of the future, reducing carbon emissions and creating a more sustainable environment using open technology. A lot of that depends on containerization and cloud native. And uh, this was released at COP26. This year, we've done a similar one on electric vehicles. And the intention now is those are going up on GitHub, and we will be building communities of contributors across the globe to participate in that. Security is high on the agenda. We launched our first summer of open source software security last summer. We did a number of webinars, podcasts, different bits and pieces. That was noted as one of the eight initiatives in 2022 that was important in security. And we'll be doing a second one this summer. But our third pillar, so we have this community. We bring the leadership together to give it a voice. We use that voice to influence law and policy. And then we develop skills and learning. And that's building the community of the future. We started with kids camps. We did two, and we got the runner-up prize in the Gnome Community Challenge. Last year, we did these webinars on future founders, and they, uh, they're very much about running a business in open source, how you generate revenue and income, how you build products. We did something similar at our conference, and the, the video from that is going to be used within a MOOC, a massive open online course with Strathclyde University, which will launch later this year. Hopefully, we will have sponsorship, and that will be free for anyone anywhere in the world to participate in. But it's going to teach skills that are needed beyond pure engineering to build open source businesses. Give you a little bit of an idea of our scale. You know, I told you we had two employees, but this is our 2021 um, MUV. And MUV is the way that you recognize press presence 
monthly unique visitors, it doesn't mean this many people looked at our article or clicked through. It means the, the articles we had and the publications they were in, this is our aggregate. And we punch way above our weight. And we do that because we're a collective. We're based on all of the people who lead within the UK. This is our Twitter impact last year. We average now, the honours list gets us, as you'll see, the honours list is a very British thing, but it gets us a huge traction. Year one, it was around 400,000 impressions on one tweet. Year two with next gen, it was around 150, and this year it's around 250,000 again. So if we take that out, we're now averaging 100,000 impressions a month on the Open UK Twitter um, account, despite everything that's happened on Twitter, despite what Ellen's done. And, you know, Mastodon's rise, but Mastodon doesn't really work in the same way. So it's hard for us to give you realistic stats. What we have seen is a bit of a rise in LinkedIn. I mentioned State of OpenCon, our first annual conference. We will be doing our second either on the 31st of January, 1st of February or 6th, 7th of February. We're just waiting for the, the venue to be confirmed. And we've got two possibilities. It won't be the same place as last time. So all of this is about open source. Why does it matter? Well, and what is it? For me, open source can be simply defined if you're doing it for a contract. And it's source code where the source is freely available and it's distributed on an open source initiative approved, an OSI approved license. And that second bit to me is really important. So this is the OSD, the open source definition. I couldn't tell you what the 10 terms are and I can almost guarantee you that nobody in this room can. I doubt if any member of the OSI board could even recite them. For me, the two really important definitions are five and six. No discrimination against persons or groups, i.e. everybody anywhere in the world can use open source and participate in it any point in time. Second one, no discrimination against fields of endeavor. Doesn't matter what you do with it, you will not be stopped from doing it. There's no moral judgment, there's no ethical judgment, there's no division geographically. And these are at the very heart of what makes open source open source. Without those, you might share your code, you might have public source, but you're not going to meet the standard to be an OSI approved license and you're not open source. And you're probably wondering what all of this has got to do with Kubernetes and cloud native, but we'll get there. One thing all of the licenses that the OSI approves have in common is that they disclaim liability to use a lawyer's term. So they say that I'm not liable, I'm a developer, I've created code, I'm giving it to you free of charge, to the extent that the law allows me to disclaim liability, to say that I'm not liable, I'm not liable. You might recognize it, it's the MIT license, so a very permissive commonly used license. These three clauses come from GPL3 and these from Apache 2.0. All say much the same thing, I'm not liable. If you take my code and you use it in an environment, you, the end user, have made that choice and it's up to you to manage it. So when I started in all of this at Canonical, it was really hard. And it was really hard because nobody in big companies would use our code. We were banging on doors and we were trying to get into those companies and we couldn't get in. And we couldn't get in because we had this risk averse block and the risk averse block was procurement it was finance and it was legal. They didn't necessarily understand open source well, but they understood how to stop things happening in their companies. And there's been a shift in the last decade, particularly the last five years. And that shift has come through a number of different things. I think the primary shift is digitalization, right? So the role that you all play as engineers has been elevated. The role that engineers have in every company, not just tech companies, is much more important. I know the last few months and the layoffs may not make people feel important, and I know people are worried about salaries. But with digitalization, every business needs engineers. Every business uses software. It either creates, distributes, or has its products consumed using it, and there's no way around it. So the engineers have become the decision makers. And if you combine that with the, the sort of escalation we've seen around the usage of Git through the public repos, through distributed um, code collaboration, you see a time when you can go to GitHub, you can take a, a package and you can bring it into a, a big commercial entity without going through legal procurement or finance so they can't block it anymore. So it's no longer a question of contract. The contract that you have for that code is the open source license. That's where your, your rights come from. You don't need a contract. It shouldn't be mentioned in the contract. And if you're mentioning it in a contract, you're creating problems for yourself. 
You might say we're using XYZ, but don't try and license it in a commercial contract. So what you see is you can take the code into your organization and use it, and you only have to go to legal finance or procurement for approvals or contracts when you get to a stage of buying something like support. And generally, we don't do that um, at the same time as we start to use the code. The third thing that's had the impact is something, and this is a really out of date slide. This is, I think, the last slide from when Dan Cohen was running this. Um, what you see is that the cloud has really shifted open source because the cloud's built on open source, right? You're here in Amsterdam, many of you for cloud native, you know this. Microsoft, when I joined Canonical, was bug zero. The destruction of Microsoft was one of our goals. Things shifted. Um, by 2018, Microsoft was on a journey. They were talking about their journey publicly. Today, they're the biggest single contributor to open source, according to the, the stats. And this is Steve Wally, a mate of mine, keynoting the cloud, the, not the cloud native, the open source summit in Edinburgh in 2018. And he explains Microsoft's journey as three things. First of all, developers who've learned to code in the last sort of 20, 30 years all use open source. It's just the way people do it. It's the practical, sensible way to code. Secondly, innovation in open source has been way ahead of the curve. And it means that many products are only available open source. Many packages are only available open source initially. So customers specifically ask Microsoft for it. And the third thing is Azure. You can't run a cloud business without not just using, but engaging with open source. You can't just use, you have to give back. You have to be part of the community. You have to have influence. You have to contribute. And we're seeing that spread. We're seeing it spread through different sectors, different verticals. Automotive has been a big one. This year, mobile is really in the public glare. Companies like Rakuten using Kubernetes, GSMA announcing their uh, APIs. And we also see it in the public sector. In the UK in 2012, we were one of the first countries in the world to have an open source first strategy, policy. Lacked a lot of procedures behind it and it lacked teeth, so we didn't have anything to sort of hold them to when they didn't. 2019, we see Europe starting to talk about their digital decade. 2020, we see the COVID apps, but it's not just the apps, it's the back end too. And we see the NHS and the energy sector in the UK positively shifting for their national infrastructure. So think about it. The work you do, the contributions you make, become part of something that is actually the national infrastructure for our enterprises, for our public sector, and our critical national infrastructure. So open source is one, right? The battles that I was in at Canonical, Microsoft's on board, we're now the, the dominant way to code. 48 to 98% of code is built open source today. So now what? Well, we used to talk about FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and we used to accuse Microsoft of spreading it. Today, we still have FUD, but it's a different kind of FUD. It's a different kind of confusion. During lockdown in 2020, we saw um, some stuff from people who should know better. Big cloud companies are free. Think back to the open source definition. They're free to use open source software, and they're free to use it as they wish. They can use it commercially. Definitions five and six of the open source definition. Should you choose to open source your software, they can use it. But what we saw was this got as far as the New York Times talking about the fact they were strip mining. Now, strip mining is a New York um, term, a New York uh, legal term, and it's used where, or it was used in the 70s for coal mining, where you overmined the coal and you left nothing behind. And that's what a number of open source companies were accusing Amazon of doing. And then we saw this from Shea Bannon, the founder at Elastic, where he was doubling down on open, except what he was actually doing was walking away from open. He was moving to the SSPL, which is not an OSI approved license because it doesn't meet the definition. That and the commons clause, a bit disingenuous, implying that they're open source when they're not and causing a lot of confusion amongst engineers, understandably very, very understandably, but this is very definitely FUD, and it's still going on. We see Lightbend and ACA last year. Interesting attack that we're now seeing. I mentioned the mobile sector is a massive adopter at the moment, and we're seeing a problem with the standards bodies. So we have um, Etsy, who are in the Nice area in the south of France. If you're part of this, you go down there a few times a year. It's a very nice trip. And you get to go and set standards. And those standards tend to be based on FRAND. 
fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory. But what they do is they charge you for patents because they have standard essential patents, SEPs. And SEPs have a royalty charge that is fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory, but it is a royalty. So what they're trying to do is make that flow with open source and the tour and friction because our ecosystem needs to be free to move. And we've seen organizations like 4IP and some of the telcos who have a lot of money, right? Telcos, 40 years old, it's relatively immature, it's lost a lot of its revenue with things like roaming charges being taken away, things like the OTTs going over the top with WhatsApp. So what we're seeing is telcos actively trying to redefine open source. Now, open source to me is much more than that legal definition, right? It's having a community it's having collaboration, it's having contribution, it's having good documentation, maintenance, plans for the future, I could go on. It's all of those things, but that legal definition with the OSI approved license has to be at the heart or we allow people to undermine. And that's what these people are trying to do. They're trying to say that we have three, 400 licenses, many that aren't OSI approved that are open source to allow them to create open source, but with my patents. And it just doesn't work. Don't take my word for it in the, the fucking book. There is a chapter by Knut Blind from Fraunhofer talking about exactly that, picking up on the work that they did for the European Commission in this area and explaining that the two are just in friction and don't work together. So what we need is we need open standards that everybody can freely use without patents. And bear in mind, 70% of those mobile patents are held by seven companies and they turn over billions, billions of dollars a year on those patents. We could also, where they have SEP, standard essential patents, work with defensive patent pools like OIN. And that's not new. We saw that done in 2014, with the, or 2012 actually, with the Rockstar Patent Consortium. Another problem we're facing is uh, geopolitical shift. You wouldn't really think international politics would be affecting open source, right? But it is hugely. So we see this letter from uh, Elizabeth von der Leyen, Ursula von der Leyen rather, appointing Marguerite Vestager as the VP for Digital in Europe. And you see her talking about major shifts in the way from global power structures to local politics. Then you see Brexit. This was at FOSDEM in 2020. We were outside the commission when we Brexited and they turned the lights off on us. And it's been pretty much the same since. So I don't want to sound like a, a drama queen, but only last week I was having a, a conversation with one of the directors of a, a European equivalent of ours. And I said to him, you know, it can be hard because uh, things that we used to be part of, we used to engage with, it sort of feels like we're not wanted post-Brexit. He said, oh, no, 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 you're not wanted. The Commission has told us not to bring you in. We don't want the UK there. We don't want UK speakers. We don't want Open UK. That's not open source, my friends. Open source is for everybody doesn't matter whether you're from China, the US, the UK or Europe. It's about us collaborating on a global basis. And we have these problems globally. It's not just with Brexit and the UK. We have it between the, the European Union and the US. We have it between the EU and China. We have it between the US and China. We have it between the UK and China, where there are discussions about excluding contributors, wanting to know if anybody's from China who's contributed. And it's not just on the political level. You know, the ultimate geopolitical shift has to be war. And that doesn't just affect us in that way. It also affects us with things like protest wear. I go back to my definitions five and six of the open source definition. Definition six, any purpose. We can't restrict any people, the Russians, from using open source, heartbreaking as it is to watch what's been going on in Ukraine. And then we see the infrastructure that I talked to you about being attacked. And we see it attacked because with digitalization, we're sitting at a point in time where governments are more concerned about technology than they ever have been, maybe rightly. They're concerned about software. They're concerned about software security. And in being concerned about that, we see the requirement for S-bombs. We see the reaction to Log4J, a plan between the Open SSF and the US government and many companies to start to roll out fixing the perceived problems and the real problems around software security. Now, the first thing I would always say if software security comes up as a topic is that it's a software problem, not an open source one. We just happen to have our own nuances and we wash our dirty linen in public. So it is very, very clear and transparent when we have problems. But we also have a collective response. But what we're seeing here only last month from the Biden administration 
is a shift, and a shift to making the commercial distributors responsible for the code they distribute. Now, I talked to you before about the importance of the end user responsibility for the, the situation they choose to use it in. They try to call out, and they've done their best, I think, that they could. And I've highlighted this here, open source, um, the fact that developers should not be liable. But that's going to require quite a lot of education as this becomes law and making sure we understand how to keep our licenses away from our commercial agreements. Because software that's freely distributed without a payment will not incur this liability. And we're going to have to be really clear about it. Here in Europe, we've got the Cyber Resilience Act, completely different flavour to the same kind of regulation. Uh, massive outcry from the open source community complete lack of understanding of what open source is and the open source definition. There's f on the right-hand side here, this page will take you through to 40 organizations' responses to it. Recital 10 talks about commercial open source. No such thing. The Americans get it right. They talk about open source being distributed commercially and paid for. Open source is free for anyone to use, whether they're in a company or not. It's free for anyone to contribute to, whether they're in a company or not. No such thing as commercial open source. There is just open source. They also start to talk about product liability, and they, they make software uh, subject to liability even if it's not embedded. And the fines for non-compliance are pretty high, as you can see. They're also looking at having uh, some sort of audit from a department or an organization like San Senelec, some sort of standards body telling you how to code and to check that code meets the required standards. The last meeting I was allowed to go to, and uh, I wasn't allowed to speak at, in the commission was in 2019. And at that meeting, they suggested that we ought to certify developers if they were going to code. Wow. So I responded, and I think it's the best applause from the smallest audience I've ever had, and it's probably in a recording somewhere, but they really don't like me. Um, Product Liability Directive is really overt about what they're trying to do to, to software and the liability they're trying to put in there. There's a lot of detail in here. You can look at the slides, you know, if you want to afterwards. It's been a lot of work in the UK, but through the kind of reporting we've done and the engagement we've been able to have with the, the public sector, with the policymakers, we've got some decent recognition in our consultation around open source and its position in the ecosystem, the fact that proprietary code uses it as well, the fact that proprietary software is built in open source languages. And we see a recognition of the value of the software, the open source software community and what it brings and a desire not to place burden on it. Now, the next step for us is getting this translated into law that makes sense for open source in the UK. The consultation ends in May. We'll be publishing something in advance and encouraging others to submit to. They're also trying to work in the international context. I don't know if their experience is any better than mine, but maybe it is. So, state of open. Open source is one, but is it sustainable? Nice piece in the new stack after our conference. I think there's three key things that we, all of you, need to be thinking about. And the first is curation. Term Eric Brewer at Google came up with, he wrote this piece in our State of Open report last year. Curation to me is the good technical hygiene that you're all talking about this week at KubeCon. The sort of processes and procedures that they were talking about in the last talk and the good governance and the understanding of how you do open source from day one. And we need to see enterprises and the public sector starting to curate open source properly, not just sticking it into their organization and wondering what they've done. We need to see them start to build, particularly in the public sector, an understanding that open source is more than that legal definition. They want to avoid lock-in, they want to create code that's recycled and reused. It has to be developed in the open, it has to have community around it, it has to have contribution and plans for the future, not just a fly past on GitHub thrown over the wall. That requires government and the public sector to build an understanding of open source. You've seen what happens with the Cyber Resilience Act when they don't and they get things wrong. But also I think it needs a step further. We need to start to see open source and the infrastructure. I explain it to them as a pizza. They don't necessarily, when you start talking to policymakers, understand technology and open source. And I always say the toppings are like all the things that people want to talk about, whether that's the cloud, the internet, ML, blockchain, AI, whatever it is, those are the toppings that you put there that you all have your view on. And sitting underneath it is a base that most people are not interested in, and that's open source. We need them to understand that that base is there. We need them to invest in it properly. 
to consider it as a digital public good. We also need, as a community, to start to demonstrate our value and speak up more. We need to show that value. I've put one set of uh, infographics up from 2022 already. These are our 2021. We use the formula the Commission had to demonstrate 43.15 billion of contribution to GDP in the UK from open source. We worked with an economist from the UK Office of National Statistics to move this a bit further, and we got us 46.5 billion. We're currently working on what questions to ask for a survey this year to see how we can make that work better, because these figures were based on around 250,000 developers in the UK. I think I'm proud to say that GitHub has told us in January that we're over 3 million now. The nearest in Europe is Germany at 2.1 million. 4.5% of the UK population now is a GitHub account, and our goal is to double or treble that, because that's the way that you measure open source developers. It's not accurate, but it's what we're stuck with. If anybody's got a better idea, please talk to me. So uh, this is how you contact me, or Open UK, or follow us. Really keen to talk to people, whether they're in the UK or anywhere else, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Will open source fail? Andy put a bet on LinkedIn that my answer was going to be no. I'm afraid my answer to will open source fail is maybe. And I have one copy of the fucking book. If anybody would like it, it means I don't have to carry it home with me. So whoever wants it can have it if they do. Thank you. Oh, you want to do questions? Am I allowed? I think I'm probably over time, but yeah, sure, for me. I can't even see. I haven't got my specs on. If You might need to push that on. Hello, hello. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder why you might, might, well, you probably, you're not involved, but uh, could you m maybe make us understand why Grafana choose to go for GPL? AGPL. They went AGPL, for G yeah. well, but that's not an MIT, yeah. not a CNCF, yeah. anyway promoted uh, license. What, yeah. what made them go? Is, is, I have the feeling... That's more of a European thing? Although no, it no, 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 it's not. It's a global thing. And it's all about revenue generation and protecting your revenue. It's the same conversation that we had with um, um, both uh, Elastic and Mongo, and that's shifting to SSPL. And Grafana very much learned from what had gone wrong with Elastic and Shea Bannon's doubling down and open and moved to SSPL. And they wanted to stay within an OSI-approved license. And AGPL is the best way that you can try and protect code that isn't distributed because a lot of the provisions in copyleft require distribution before they kick in and AGPL is uh, it was st structured to try and protect the the developers a bit more so that's why they went to AGPL any more oh god loads okay <laughs> go to the back first oh I have to give you the mic hang on oh, I've gone the wrong way there you go on. Thank you. A uh, bit of a side question. Yeah. What, what do you make of OpenAI, which is, you know, started as open yeah. and is clearly not open? Yeah. So, Thank you. That was my question. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know why I'm using that. I was purposely avoiding AI for a long time because it is very difficult, right? And it's very hard to have the answers to it. What I make of open AI is that I would like it to be open, but clearly they've shifted their model and they're making a lot of money now. And they're making a lot of money from a few companies and very cleverly. But what we've seen is a massive response. And on Open UK's Twitter account, whenever I see any open equivalents, I push the information out on it. And I think we all need to, to sort of follow that and try and engage with it. I'm more sad that we didn't do anything about AI in the book because five years ago it wasn't relevant to open source in the way it is today. But we, we need collectively to really sit down and work this out. Uh, the OSI did something called Deep Dive AI. They did a, a, a series of um, podcasts and a report earlier this year. And there's going to be a lot more coming. The commission, there's a piece in the FT, I think, yesterday for, about the commission regulating how you code. <laughs> And what they're talking about is copyright and respecting copyright, which could actually be good for open source. But at the same time, it's going to make it harder to... You're going to have to list out the copyright that you've used to train the AI. I mean, that's massive. It's going to be almost impossible to do. And if you're a small provider trying to compete with the likes of open AI, it's going to be really difficult. I have tried to talk to my almost namesake, Greg Brockman, at OpenAI, and I've not been able to get to him. 
only person I know that knows them is James Governor, and he couldn't get a response. So if anybody happens to know them and would like to introduce me, I'd love to talk to them. Alex, there you go. No, I, I was going to say, okay. what, what about Microsoft? <laughs> what about Microsoft and all this? <laughs> yeah. I think you should ask Microsoft for comment on that as the number one contributor to open source in the, the world. I would like to think that they're going to open up their AI. But I think you should ask them. Yep. Uh, you mentioned that GovUK had adopted an open first policy. Yeah. And some countries, I don't think they have official ones, but like some municipalities in Germany yeah. use a lot of open source. In Norway, I know a lot of the state-owned mm -hmm. things publish everything. Uh, do you have any like success stories that have come out of it, even though it, you said it There's was loads. without teeth? There's loads and loads. Last year, I interviewed 15 organizations for the NHS and the public sector, and they used case studies from it. The problem is, and this is a universal problem, not a UK problem, they use that legal definition, right? So they say... We've got a couple of million to give away to open source organizations for five, five of you will get 400,000 each or whatever it is. And everybody applies. And the open source organizations are less used to doing this and don't sell so well. So organizations that have been proprietary often win that money. And what they have to do to be open source is to publish the code on GitHub with an open source license. That legal definition I went back to I've been mentoring some of them for the UK, and it's been heartbreaking. So I've been talking to them about contribution, about community, about developing in the open, and almost without exception, the projects I've been mentoring, while they're really interested in open source, are doing a fly pass. They're throwing it over the wall and they're leaving it, and nobody but them is ever going to touch it because it's going to be abandoned code on GitHub. So one of the things that I'm trying to persuade the UK to shift to is to have a list of requirements around developing in the open, around the code having to have a community and take contributions, or at least a community manager trying to work on that. So there are success stories, but they're not successful enough because they're not required to be, if that makes sense. And we need to do, a lot, and it's everywhere in the world, and we need to do a lot more work. And I think the story for government is that they shift to open source on a cost basis generally, right? It's the wrong reason, but it's usually number one. And they do it to avoid lock-in, and they do it to create code that's recycled and renewed. So when I asked one of those companies how they were going to maintain the code, they told me they had a three-year contract. And I'm like, that's not open source, you know? So um, we, we need to get that moving so that they avoid that lock-in and so that they do create code that people will want to reuse. I think we're probably just about out of time. Was there one more very quickly? Very, very quickly. Sorry, this might, might be a quick question, forgive me, but the Cyber Resilience Act. Yeah. And I, I would say that it looks, like, it looks kind of scary. Um, yeah. And we're looking at possible mandates and yeah. regulation, et cetera. Um, and this is a huge issue, but I guess what's the status of that? I can do that. Yeah, no, so but, the, but, but uh, yeah. uh, the Biden administration, it's my understanding, but probably being naive, but they're proposing recommendations more so, and they haven't spoke, for example, different things, S-bombs, for example, mm -hmm. how they're implemented, et cetera. Or are they arguably pushing through scary things? What they've time. said is, so with the, the CRA, the consultation finished in January. There was a lot of confusion about the date. Um, it kept changing. A lot of people missed the date. But there are 40 organizations who are listed out on the OSI website who responded. And you can see the problems with it there. I don't believe the European Commission can go ahead with it in that format. I mean, you just cannot have the, the recital they've got that redefines open source. You know, it's, yeah. just, it's just wrong. And they have an OSPO, so you would really hope that they would you know, be able to work with them and improve it. In the US and in the UK, both governments have said that they're going to work with industry. But that means that we need the support of all of the people in this room and many more as the policy organizations that are trying to lobby, that are trying to get government attention going forwards. And we need to see those sort of collective voices in every country pushing to make sure that open source is properly protected. Can you follow up? Yeah, yeah, no, they really want me to go. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your questions. Thank you.